Lesser known analyst Peter Kraut thinks we're going to see $300 this bull market. Around the 2000 to 2002, or let's say 1999 to 2001 period, you had a similar messy period, a transition again to a start of a precious metals bull market. So from about late 1999 until about 2001, when some people saw the dot com peak and figured there's a switch, now we're going to move into a new era where bonds and stocks have had their run and it's the time now for precious metals. Um, people, some people got into precious metals and if they were able to hold on long enough, they rode a fantastic bull market for at least arguably a decade before you had a what I call a mid-secular bull a correction. But again, that, that messy transition period was hard to hang on. Um, and yet it was very lucrative if you were able to uh, assess where we were, partake in it, and then again, as I say, hang on. Back over the last 22 years, since 2000, silver and gold have handily beat stocks. The S&P is up about 180%, silver is up about 250%, and gold is up over 500%. So if you ask the average investor, where is the best place been to be, uh, in the last say 20 22 years you almost invariably are going to hear stocks and yet that is not the case at all today so uh, i still as i say very much believe despite the corrections we've been through we're, we are in a, a long-term secular bull market for precious metals silver in particular outperforms gold the first three of these uh of these charts or uh, portions of these charts show uh, uh, bull cycles for precious metals and as you can see, the, bull, the blue line uh, runs up above, especially in the latter part, it runs up above the yellow line. So silver, as I say, proves itself time and time again to outperform gold in bull markets, in precious metals bull markets. So um, we have yet to see that this time around, um, but that certainly bodes well for the, the potential for silver. But with the, the US dollar index now near 109, 110, and who knows, perhaps, running to 115, 120, it's impossible to say. But uh, with the Fed continuously raising rates and the outlook is uh, still, as I say, for a couple of more rate hikes, chances are that at the very least, the ratio is gonna stay elevated and that could act as a headwind for silver. We look at silver uh, before, during, and around recessions. Both metals tend to struggle before recessions. That middle section, that narrow section, is how they react during recessions. And so you can see that uh, silver struggles more than gold does during recessions. But then the, the right part is post-recession. And so you see a lot more green because that means that silver tends to outperform during uh, the periods that, especially the 12 months that when you come out of recession. And that intuitively makes sense because silver has the industrial component to it. Inventories on the COMEX and on the London uh, exchange um, have been falling, especially since, say, the middle or so of last year. Uh, and we've seen six to nine months of continuous drawdown. So uh, someone wants to take physical possession of that silver for whatever reason. I like to say that silver is sticky money. So this chart shows the, the sort of grayish pink portion, the gray, uh, that colored area at the bottom, shows silver, physical silver inventories in ETFs, silver ETFs globally. And so the first thing to notice is that since the first silver ETF in 2006, on balance, this has almost only either grown or moved sideways. And laid over that is the squiggly line in purple is the silver price. So the silver price is obviously quite volatile, goes through run-ups and then corrections and then moves sideways and then goes through more run-ups. But, and those are the blue periods when you have corrections in the silver price, those blue bars. So those black arrows that I've overlaid over that shows is to try and point out that despite the fact that you've had either large or still notable corrections in the silver price, you still have silver inventories during those considerable or medium corrections in the silver price, you still have silver inventories in ETFs either move sideways mainly or even actually increase. So people tend to buy silver and hold on to it again on balance. Between 2013 and 2021, solar demand grew 
125% for silver. In 2021, it was up 13%, and this year it's expected to grow another 12%. So the green bars are the growth in, uh, in um, demand for silver from the solar industry. The orange line across that is the amount of silver that goes into each solar panel. That, of course, has been leveling off. But if you look at the expected um, upcoming technologies for solar panels, it's likely that the, the next technology will use about 50% more per panel, and the one to follow on that could use as much as 150% more silver per panel. And there are all sorts of developments coming um, in China that dominates the, the solar panel industry. They've got things like double-sided solar panels, which would naturally likely double the amount of silver required for each panel. So there are all kinds of things in the pipeline that uh, suggest that the, the solar industry is really going to uh, uh, help keep very much, uh, very much robust demand for silver. Silver's got its challenges. We talked about recession, uh, especially if there's a slowdown. Uh, in industrial demand could certainly uh, perhaps be affected. The strong dollar, strong bond yields as bonds become, especially with higher yields, an alternative, an attractive asset, perhaps instead uh, for some investors for silver. And I talked about the transition. But the outlook, I think, remains bullish. I think that inflation on balance is likely to remain high. The dollar will certainly peak at some point. Uh, it's tough on multinationals, American multinationals that sell around the world, especially when their products are more expensive based on uh, the exchange. I think industrial demand will remain supportive and I think at some point investment demand will kick in. I say inflation is going to remain high because when you look at the, um, the uh, energy crisis, especially in Europe right now, some people are facing electricity bills are 10 times above the levels they had last year. Europe is talking about committing as much as uh, close to $400 billion over the next few years to help cap uh, people's electricity bills. Britain has said over the next two years it would cap electricity bills. That's likely to cost them over $100 billion. And then you've got things like the U.S. student loan bailouts program that's going to cost, apparently according to the uh, Congressional Budget Office, as much as $330 billion over the next 10 years. And then you have what I put in quotes, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that's going to be a lot of money invested in production, energy production, supposed to reduce carbon emissions by about 40% over 10 years. And then uh, about $370 billion will go to renewables and to new climate measures. But the implications for solar are huge. Uh, there was a study by Princeton, Dartmouth and a couple of other research groups that together looked at the effects of the Inflation Reduction Act. And they said that in 1920, uh, sorry, in 2020, you had 10 gigawatts of new installation of uh, solar per year. They expect that by 2024, so just two years out, that could be five times that level. By 2030, it could be 10 times the 2020 level. And so the, re the act is supposed to uh, shovel about $320 billion towards solar alone. That would double the current growth levels. And they've actually renewed, uh, they've, they've extended um, the solar investment tax credit. So it's really a lot of support and push for solar. This is why we've been facing deficits in the silver, uh, on the silver supply side. There was about a 50 million ounce deficit in 2021. We're expecting about a 70 million ounce deficit this year. And the Silver Institute expects deficits for years uh, on end. If you look at the miners um, switching gears, uh, they've been, the larger miners have been very much uh, happy with their free cash flow. On balance, gold and silver have, are, are above, considerably above levels that they were at a few years ago. Um, and if specifically, if you look at the gold side, uh, they've had big budget, they've been spending on exploration, but the lack of discoveries uh, is, is obvious. If you look at those bars at the bottom um, on the right side, uh, there have been no major discoveries on the gold side. Silver miners are not spending on CapEx. Um, that means on their, in their current uh, production to expand and to renew things, as well as on the exploration side. So it certainly looks like, um, especially on the silver side, they've downloaded that effort to the juniors. And so one of the threats to silver supply is that uh, only about 30%, under 30% comes from primary silver mining. As much as 70% comes from mining other metals like gold, copper, lead, and zinc. And so if you, have a, if you do have a slowdown and you do have some uh, pullback in the production of some of these base metals, that's almost certainly going to affect the silver supply and exacerbate things. 
you look at silver versus commodities over the last couple of years, commodities have exploded higher. Silver has not kept up. It would need to double its current price just to get the kinds of returns you've had in the last two years in commodities overall. Um, the outlook near term actually could be quite bullish. Uh, the next several months, you've got uh, um, a, a very atypical situation with uh, uh, with hedgers, um, the smart money hedgers being the, um, uh, the companies like uh, the large producers and so on that have uh, bullish uh, bets right now. They're net long in silver futures. That really does not happen very often. So that means they really don't see very much downside at all in silver price. And so the opportunity in silver is physical silver or silver stocks. Um, physical silver right now, unfortunately, especially the coins and the, some of the bars are have really high premiums. And given what's been happening in the lack of spending by, the, by a lot of the majors, I really see a lot of opportunity in the explorers. Uh, they are highly undervalued, especially in the last six months. And uh, you, you know, it's one thing to look at the silver price, which we tend to do in, in US dollars. But if you look at the silver price in a basket of major currencies around the world, that's that blue line. It has easily surpassed, especially in the last sort of eight to 10 years, uh, what it's done in the US dollar. So that's what a lot of people around the world are seeing in terms of silver price. So it has not been as depressed as perhaps a lot of us tend to think. Um, very quickly, some forecasts in terms of the silver price. A guy you may know, Rick Rule, thinks in the next five years we'll see silver north of 50. Keith Neumeyer of uh, First Majestic thinks we're going to see triple digit this uh, bull market. Citigroup sees $40 in a year, $50 to $100 in the coming years. Herring and Rosenzweig sees as much as $500 this decade. Great guy presenting here, Chen Lin, sees silver as the next lithium. Um, he says that if you sell at $30 or $40, you're going to regret it. And an obscure, lesser known analyst, Peter Kraut, thinks we're going to see $300 this bull market. So take that for what it's worth. Um, to wrap up, remember, silver is crucial to the green revolution. I talked only about solar, but you've got electronics. You've got all sorts of other aspects where silver is irreplaceable. It's an inflationary asset. It's proven itself over decades and centuries to prove to uh, purchase, um, to protect your purchasing power. It's, a money, it's been money for thousands of years, and it certainly is historically undervalued.